Hello again, everybody. We're going to talk about foreign body obstruction here. So this comes with our upper airway diseases that we tend to see in children. Uh, foreign body obstruction, of course, can happen in anybody, though, uh, but we tend to see them in children. There is no pathogen, of course. The causative factor is a foreign body. Surprise. Okay, so like I said, they tend to be children, uh, especially less than three years of age. They make up about 73% of all cases. One third of aspirated objects are nuts. That was news to me when I was putting this uh, presentation together. Uh, so particularly peanuts. And um, so that is something that is worth noting, especially if you're a parent, do not feed your children under the age of three nuts. Uh, so that's one third of all aspirated objects. Other things include raw carrots, apple, dried beans, popcorn, sunflower seeds, watermelon seeds, and small toys and parts. So small toys, I would have thought, would be the most commonly aspirated, but indeed they tend to be nuts. Um, so this is important. Uh, I'll just preface. Uh, this is important when you're getting your history. Uh, make sure that in addition to asking how the symptoms came on, was it sudden? Uh, did you see any gagging? Uh, also ask what has the child been eating? What have you been giving them? Uh, and if the answer is nuts, we're, we're going to see actually the, we're going to skip imaging and we're going to go straight to bronchoscopy. The number one complication of complete obstruction is asphyxiation, and this can be deadly. Uh, this is recognized as sudden respiratory distress followed by an inability to speak or cough. Um, and so if there is coughing, then it's not a complete asphyxiation because you are getting some air out, which means typically you can get some air in too. Uh, so if there's complete obstruction, there should be an inability to speak or cough completely. Globular objects tend to be the most frequent offenders of complete obstruction because there's really no way that it can turn and still leave some area for, uh, for, for air to pass through. And so that's why uh, nuts can be so problematic because they tend to be globular in shape. The most common location of obstruction is the right main stem bronchus. This is 58% of cases, and this just has to do with the angle uh, that the, uh, the bronchi uh, form. So uh, when you're coming off of the, uh, coming off of the, the trachea and uh, you've got your left bronchi and uh, left bronchus and your right bronchus, the left bronchus tends to be a little bit more horizontal than the right bronchus, which is a little bit more vertical. And so it's easier for objects to fall into the right bronchus than into the left bronchus. Clinical manifestations of incomplete obstruction. So this is, uh, if, if obviously, if you have complete obstruction, then you're going to have inability to cough or speak. And generally, those patients don't come into the hospital because they will either die or you get uh, the object out via Heimlich maneuver. So initially, with an incomplete obstruction, and this is usually going to be part of the history that the parent gives you, uh, there are violent paroxysms of coughing uh, just because of the uh, neurologic reflexes. Uh, there is gagging and then airway obstruction below where the object is located. This is a ball valve effect, so it, typically it's easier to get air in, but you can't get air out, and there's some air trapping. Uh, you can also see wheezing uh, and drooling. There is after that, there, there may come a, an asymptomatic interval if the object is not, uh, doesn't get coughed out. And so the foreign body at this point can become lodged to the reflexes, will subsequently diminish, um, and then the patient will become more comfortable because there's no coughing or gagging or any of that stuff that's going to make the child uh, sort of agitated. Uh, this is a problematic period because this is where you can get a non-diagnosis or a misdiagnosis. So a parent could notice the paroxysms of coughing and all that gagging and stuff, but then it goes away and the parent may think that at this point there's nothing wrong and don't need to go into the hospital, don't need to see the doctor. It can also be problematic for you because if you don't notice any symptoms, you, there may be a non-diagnosis or there may be a misdiagnosis. If there continues to be maybe a little bit of wheezing uh, or strider, then you may misdiagnose that as croup or spasmodic croup or uh, uh, something like that because uh, you're going to have a patient with no fever, looks otherwise well, and has wheezing, and that can easily be uh, misinterpreted as croup. Complications over time, if you have a lodged object, you get inflammation. Uh, you can also get rotting of the, uh, of the food particle, if it is indeed food and that can cause uh, infection. Uh, of course, since you have an obstruction, you risk atelectasis, and uh, that can lead into pneumonia as well. Other things, of course, fever, that comes from an infection, uh, cough, and hemoptysis is the, uh, the lining of the airway uh, necrosis. So again here, this can complicate, these complications can complicate your diagnosis. 
we don't associate fever, cough, hemoptysis with a foreign body obstruction. Um, and so it can lead to that, though, if it's not taken care of uh, quickly. Uh, so keep that in mind. I don't expect that the USMLE will give you a question like that because it's very difficult to uh, diagnose foreign body obstruction without a significant workup at this point. Now where the object is, is going to uh, play a role in what symptoms will be more prominent. So if the object is lodged in the larynx, typically this is going to lead to asphyxiation. What generally happens here is a flat, thin object, like a coin, can become lodged into the vocal cords on the sagittal plane, and that's going to lead to complete asphyxiation because this is a narrow passageway, and you get a coin lodged in there, there's no way for air to go through, and, uh, and so you get asphyxiation. Uh, this also, if it's incomplete, can manifest as croup. You can get stridor, uh, hoarseness, cough, and dyspnea. Uh, so again, this is going to be important to get your history here. Uh, and in some ways, this can mimic spasmodic croup uh, because you have a sudden onset of stridor. Uh, so it's going to be important to have a history. Uh, if it's, you know, the spasmodic croup tends to be more they have a long-standing history of these croup-like symptoms, uh, whereas with uh, foreign body obstruction, there uh, was uh, probably these uh, paroxysms of coughing and gagging, um, and then uh, you have this continued stridor. A tracheal foreign body, uh, generally this is going to include a choking reflex, of course, uh, and then followed by uh, stridor and wheezing. Uh, in this case, uh, you tend to have positive x-rays. We're not going to see that all the time, though. Uh, AP and lateral neck x-rays will be abnormal in 92% of cases. A bronchial foreign body has a distinctive symptom, and that is unilateral wheezing. And so in this case, as you're trying to get air out, there's an obstruction that leads to turbulence and hence the wheezing. Uh, you can get an expiratory chest radiograph, and the signs will include air trapping on the affected side. and so you breathe out, all your air should get out, but if you have a foreign body that obstructs that, there's going to continue to be air on the affected side. That pressure is going to shift the mediastinum away from the affected side, and so a mediastinal shift should be noticed on the expiratory chest radiograph. So remember, expiratory chest radiograph for a foreign body obstruction, if you suspect that. So as I've mentioned a few times, history is critical. Sudden coughing and respiratory distress uh, will be part of the history. Important to ask the parent what was around the child when, when the symptoms started. What have you fed the patient? Or um, usually the parent will know not to have toys of small parts, but has the child been playing with Big Brother's toys that maybe do have small parts? That's good to ask. Particularly ask about nuts. I want you to keep that in mind because if the child has been eating nuts, then you're going to go straight to bronchoscopy. You're not even going to bother with imaging because the index of suspicion at that point is so high that we really have no need to do, uh, to do imaging. So if the diagnosis is questionable and the patient is stable, you can get imaging studies. You want to get an expiratory x-ray of the neck and chest. However, false negatives will occur in 15 to 30 percent of cases. And so even if you have negative imaging, you still want to consider bronchoscopy if you have a high index of suspicion. You're also going to go straight to bronchoscopy if the patient has eaten nuts uh, or if they've been around them. So bronchoscopy is your gold standard because you can visualize the airway, and a rigid bronchoscopy is therapeutic. So before you do an extraction, uh, you want to empty the stomach to prevent aspiration. You can provide IV fluids and then extract the foreign body.